welcome to Mutual Exchange Radio. Today, your host is Alex McHugh, and I'm sitting down with sci-fi author Dennis Danvers to speak about anarchist ideas in fiction, his books The Watch and Leaving the Dead, which is a short story collection, and The Life of a Writer. Mr. Danvers has written a variety of well-received sci-fi novels, including Circuit of Heaven, Time and Time Again, and End of Days, as well as the Locus and Bram Stoker nominee, Wilderness. His short fiction has appeared in Strange Horizons, Intergalactic Medicine Show, Space and Time, Lady Churchill's Rosebud Wristlet, F and SF, Realms of Fantasy, Electric Velocipede, Lightspeed, Tor.com, See the Elephant, Apex Magazine, and in the anthologies Tales of Wonder, Richmond Noir, the best of Electric Velocipede, Remapping Richmond's Hallowed Ground, and Nightmare Carnival. He taught fiction writing and science fiction and fantasy literature at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia for over 30 years. This should be a fun interview and a little different from our usual fare on Mutual Exchange Radio, so I am excited to get into it. The first question I had is I, I wanted to start by talking about your work in general, um, so from what I've seen, what I was able to find out, you play quite a bit with time as a concept. So time loops, time travels, these things have long been staples of the sci-fi genre. But I'm wondering if there's any particular reason you focused on time paradoxes as well as our relationship with history and with the future. That's a great question. Yeah, and no, partly it's a great question because I've been asked it before. You're not the first to notice that obsession. And it is everywhere. And um, in a way, I can only speculate why I'm drawn to these subjects. But um, first of all, I like narration, you know, telling stories because it plays with time. Um, I do songs and music, and I also write songs. And I even prefer narrative songs. <clears throat> so, like in high school, I, I was way into uh, folk songs, those little murder ballads and such, because they were such great stories. And also because they were old, which there was something about connecting with a story that, you know, like from the uh, 1200s or something, and, and identifying with a character across that span of time that just... I thought it was terrific uh, when I was an adolescent. And then another thing I think that made me think about time and our history is that my dad was an orphan. And as far as I knew, he didn't know anything really much about his past, and he didn't like to talk about it. So that got me, you know, I've got a lot of stories in which people try to uncover their past, and I'm interested in orphans. And there's a bit of a time travel in that, you know, kind of imagining my father's boyhood. And that sort of thing. And another way it occurred to me, especially in the light of the watch, is growing up in the segregated South, I saw the power of a you know a patently false historical narrative. They revised fast, if you will. Now you didn't have to time travel, you could just lie in the present. But uh, we certainly see a lot of that now. But um, you know, that got me in the idea of how we try to change your past. And of course, time travel stories are always doing that, you know, refighting the Civil War or something. And even a novel I did under a pseudonym, uh, The Bright Spot, um, uses a funny time travel scam to get the noir plot underway. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure why, <laughs> but I am drawn to time issues in many ways. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense, especially what you're saying about living, growing up in the segregated South, right, and seeing how the way that we tell our history matters. Oh, Uh, oh, yeah. When I read 1984, I already felt like I was familiar with the Ministry of Truth. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. and so did you say you write write songs as well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, so it's obviously something that fascinates me as well. I picked up the watch and <laughs> was very sucked into the time travel narrative. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll turn more to that in particular in a moment, but 
The second thing I wanted to ask, and I think this varies a lot from author to author, when you write novels, do you do so sort of with the intention of passing on a particular philosophical or cultural set of values? Or is this something that just sort of shines through by virtue of your having written them? Um, and then sort of related, I'm wondering, is there something in particular that you hope folks take from the stories you write? Well, the, <clears throat> I want them to have an interesting experience. And uh, to me, fiction's a, a virtual experience in words, right? In a novel, I'm trying to put you into a world uh, and give you an experience with, you know, by way of these characters and what they do and so on. And I'm the first audience. So first of all, it's going to have to be an interesting experience for me, <laughs> you know, because it takes, because I'm going to be there a while uh, with that novel. Mm. And, you know, so I want something that will be meaningful for me. And sometimes experiences teach us things, not always the same things. And sometimes an experience can be meaningless to you and might mean change somebody else's life. So, but in the course of telling the story, that's how the experience unfolds. What it means in the usual English class way, I don't think that way. And most fiction writers I know don't. A lot of literary critics do, but <laughs> um, so I'll give you an example. Uh, my first published novel, uh, Wilderness, is grew out of an interest both in wolves and werewolf stories. You know, now wolves don't act anything like werewolves do in werewolf stories. Um, and I was very curious about wolves, and I'd, I'd studied wolves a lot, and I got the idea: of what if a, a werewolf turns into a real wolf? There's no magical bullshit, and it you know it acted like a real wolf, and the human acted like a sensible human who had to deal with this. You know, they wouldn't go sit by a wide open window and go, "Oh my God, what will I do?" They'd lock themselves up. You know, so that began a story and going against type and made the werewolf a woman, which turned out to be a very good decision. And so I got to impersonate a wolf and a woman. And it's, it's like getting a good role as an actor, you know? And I did tons of wolf research, implicit in the whole project, of course. There are certain values and assumptions I have about humans and animals, you know. First and foremost, that humans are animals. So that when a later film adaptation pulled a 180 on the ending, making the point that humans are most definitely not animals, I got a migraine and went, did when I screened it, but so I was obviously invested in conveying an idea. I was pissed off when they, you know, screwed it up. So yeah, what, you know, what by the, the end of the books, I get invested, you know, in what the experience has meant to me. Though I'm open to whatever it might mean to anybody else, you know, it is, you know, it's an interaction between the writer and the reader what the story means. Um. You know, it's, but I get plenty out of it. I joke I write fiction instead of going to therapy. You know, uh, having these experiences is, you know, it's an exploration for me, too. So, anyway, enough of that. <laughs> yeah, you can still get, you can still get, the, it was actually, a, a, it was for, originally a, like, I think a four-part TV series in England. And they've chopped it down to an, uh, like an hour and a half film that you can still get. But um, there's continuity problems in the middle, which you might imagine. Uh, but it's probably better than the kind of leaden four-parter. But, but the bad ending is in both of them, which is kind of a shame because I like some of the things that they did. But, you know, <laughs> you, you don't get to control. You know, unless you're J.K. Rowling, you don't get the get to tell them what to do. Right. And I guess that's, I mean, kind of what you're saying about how the audience receives a story that you've written, right, is you can't control the experience they have either. You can set up an experience and mm -hmm. test it on yourself and all of that, but what, what someone ultimately takes. Yeah, when I taught fiction workshops, which I did tons of, you know, I'd, I'd remind these aspiring writers, you know, that when 
person's reading that thing in a magazine, you're not going to be able to sit, tap them on the shoulder and tell them what they should think. <laughs> You've got to, you know, assume that it's theirs when they're reading. So, so with that, um, focusing in on, is that this is your most, Leaving the Dead is your most recent publication? Is that the case? Just now. Just now, yes. Uh, awesome. It's a collection of short stories I've done over. Oh, I guess the oldest one goes back to 2008. Most of them are later. Um, I've done some short stories before, but most of the ones in this collection come from the later ones. And um, <laughs> probably a, a significant interest in the theme is that I had a, a near-fatal heart attack in 2009. And I pretty much divide my life into before and after. <laughs> you know? um, so I was 61, I'm 75 now. And um, I'm much, much healthier now than I was there. So I had had, you know, almost died experiences, a bad motorcycle wreck when I was like 19 or 20 and a few other things, a near drowning and a rafting thing. But this was my first or only I am dying experience. I was sure I was dying. I had I won't bore you with a whole tale, but I didn't, as you can see. Um, and it's turned out to be this wonderful thing. Um, it's reset my life. Every day is a gift. Every day is different. Be here now, you know. Um, and so and so I, I'm, I'm not intimidated by death. I feel like, you know, I will die. I know I'm going to die. It's not some thing I'd spend any time denying. So the stories aren't mo morbid. I, you know, I feel like death doesn't diminish the value of life. Uh, you know, quite the contrary. You know. Now, did you have any particular stories that you wanted to talk about in the collection? Or... So actually, the um, the second story which I think is the titular story. Yeah, um, it is, it is, right. Yeah, that, that really stood out to me, I, I think in part because, are you familiar at all with the band Mindless Self-Indulgence? No, no, I'm not. <laughs> sort of a emo, screamy, uh, early 2000s band, but they have a music video that, you know, depicts all these people in a department store who are basically zombies, mm -hmm. right? And the the repeated lyric is, you know, wake me up. Um, and so the whole time I was reading that particular story, I was thinking about this, you know, this music video. Um, and I just thought it was a very, first of all, um, accurate, I guess, sort of depiction of the sort of zombification of consumer culture, mm -hmm. um, which maybe is not even what you were going for, but that's the experience it gave me. Um, and then also just uh, fascinated by how these characters dealt with their situation, um, how comfortable they became uh, so quickly. Um, so yeah, I guess, is there is there anything more you want to dig into about that particular story, is that the experience you intended folks to have reading it? Well, that's, yeah, that's a lot of it. You know, I, that was one of those stories that, it, uh, and I've talked to fellow story writers, have this, it's, it's best when the kind of story sort of writes itself. You're not sure you're, you're, you're typing is ahead of your finger, you know, your, your fingers are ahead of your mind almost, you know. And um, why this, Partly the story grew out of an annoyance with the abundance of zombie stories. I hate zombies. It seems to me they're an excuse to, you know, wreak all sorts of violence upon humans. And it's okay, they're zombies. You know, it seems so voyeuristic and <clears throat> whatever. And I, but the one thing I learned about death is that dead's dead. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so un, there is no undead, you know, from, from my experience. And it's, it's sort of a category I'm not interested in. So everything that dies in that story, it's dead. It's not coming back. It is gone, you know. And so they, they have to deal with it in that way. 
Um, and that's that's even more horrible than these that the dead might be not quite dead and they come to eat your brains and all that stuff. No, they, they have quite enough to face being the only people that they know of still living. And, um, you know, and of course, even the dog shows up to um, have his role of being things. And um, it's very much, you know, a choose life sort of story. Um, one of the things that I like about the story is, you know, these days you don't have to mail in stories at the post office. You submit them electronically. Now, that's good and bad. And <laughs> I used to have to trudge to the post office long ago. But now you can just zip them, but it easily you can be rejected entirely too fast, right? Um, they already have time to read it, and they've already said no. And... Um, but this story, I sent it to uh, John Joseph Evans at uh, Lightspeed, and it was like, I don't know, 40 minutes or, or less, and he, and he he buys it. I mean, it was, um, I was blown away. Anyway, it usually takes weeks and weeks and weeks to get an answer. So um, he was, you know, he had been struck by it, too. And that theme, I don't know, the themes it touches upon, I realized I had a, a collection that kind of coalesce around these ideas and put that together. Yeah, I, I think maybe that's that's what struck me so much about this one is it has all those feelings of a zombie story at the beginning, mm -hmm. and then it's not. Um, <laughs> and I, I see what you mean about, you know, the zombie situation is predictable and simple, right? Mm -hmm. It's, okay, you fight these things and you have this reason to survive of fighting these things. And it's focused on that. And it is more terrifying to be faced with, okay, what's, what's my meaning and purpose now that it's just me and this other person and this dog. Right. 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 And, and yet, <clears throat> you know, even though I would never write a zombie story myself or, or this would be as close as I would come, there are some begrudgingly that I got to say, you know, okay, I liked that one. <laughs> so, but in general, I felt like it was a, it need, it's one of those things that needs a rest for a while. Mm. Yeah, there's certainly, certainly been a lot of that lately. Mm -hmm. um, so is there, are there any um, stories, or let me ask it this way, is that your favorite of the stories included in the collection, or is there another that, you know, you're really excited was in there and um, oh maybe it would be a first read when folks pick up the book. Oh, well, uh, that's, that's a good one. <laughs> um, I guess, I don't know, favorite story. Well, a good one, especially if somebody's a cat lover. Um, it's my most published story in a way. It's been translated into Chinese, Japanese, been in a couple of anthologies. Um, yeah. I think it's going to be in <clears throat> Polish. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, Healing Benjamin. And that story um, in the beginning, this young man desperately brings his cat back to life through magical means. He heals Benjamin, the cat. And, but then the cat never ages. And the story proceeds. Now, I had lost a uh, aged cat who lived to almost 20, and she had died not too long before that. But I really wrote the story uh, because of an aged dog that was <clears throat> at the very end of her life, and I was proactively, in a way, dealing with the inevitable grief that her death was going to bring me. And I wrote the story, which is equally parts, you know, you'll, you'll cry, you'll laugh, <laughs> whatever. Um, it's a comic story, but it's also a heartbreaking story. And uh, so I guess, yeah, I, I go with that one as if you want to. Uh, now, if you're not sappy at all, you might want to skip that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that, um, that one definitely hit me. My older cat is sitting across the room for me go. right now. <laughs> there you go. And also the puppy strangler, if you want something 
So wait, and no puppies are harmed in the in the riding the puppies triangle. And uh, <laughs> it's a good good disclaimer. No puppies yes. were harmed in the riding. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So something else I noticed in uh, the stories included in Leaving the Dead, and honestly in in the watch as well, um, was quite a bit of writing about writing, writing about being a writer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of our listeners uh, are not fiction writers, but, you know, are academics or are essayists. Um, sure, yeah. And so I think this is going to be very relatable. Uh, you know, what do you think, how do you think the craft of writing changes one's way of living, one's personality, or one's experience of the world. Like, what is it about being a writer that makes folks a little different from everybody else? Well, you you know, one of the things is, uh, I've taught writing for a long time, fiction writing specifically. And, you know, a lot of people paint for fun uh, and play a musical instrument for fun. And, but, and because, that, and there's a good, something, I don't know, something, not just for fun, but, you know, the art, they feel like it's good for them, you know, how it makes them feel or whatever, creating things. And people are less likely to do with that with fiction. If they, they want to, you know, capitalism has their grip on them. If it doesn't get published and paid for, it don't count. And I would strongly encourage people to, you know, write stories because it, it's fun. And it does get you to play around with different habits of thought. Pretending to be other people does, I think, make you more empathetic. Um, so Henry James advises fiction writers um, to be one of those people on whom nothing is lost. You know, so I try to do that. I try to, you know, take things in. Um, so now I had a, had a neighbor who gave me a plaque. I think this was my, I don't know, my 50th birthday, I think it was. It said, careful, or you might end up in my knob. And I did grab that up somewhere, you know. <laughs> so I, you know, I, <clears throat> and I, I, um, so I use things out of my life. You know, there's tons of autobiographical stuff in all my, Fiction, though you wouldn't necessarily know it because it's, you know, 200 years in the future and, you know, <laughs> or whatever. Um, but some, you know, some part of my life is there. People I know, that kind of thing. So I think that's kind of all I wanted to get into as far as leaving the dead, your work in general. Is there anything more you want to say about the short story collection? Um, or, you know, the culture of writing and being a writer, uh, before we hop into the more, more political questions. Um, well, one thing that, um, stay with it in terms of, uh, if you want to be a writer, I started submitting stories and writing stories when I was 18. My first novel was published when I was 41. So... And and my, my first stories too, even though I steadily submitted stories. So um, you know, and I've loved you know, I just loved doing it. That's why I kept at it. Awesome. Yeah, I, I uh, actually encourage a lot of Center for a Stateless Society's writers to not just write essays and op eds, but mm-hmm. you know, do some do some verse, <laughs> do a short story, right? <clears throat> um, write some songs. You know. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. We haven't gotten any songs yet, but maybe right. maybe this will, you know, right. maybe this will spark something. Um, so with that, I want to turn to the sort of more political side of things. I actually didn't include this question in the outline, but I figure before we get into it, I should ask, how would you describe, you know, your own politics and sort of political stance before I make all sorts of assumptions about what they are? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I'm um <clears throat> I'm I'm very left. Um, whether I'm a an anarchist myself, I'm not. No. There's a, an election coming up here in Virginia, um, legislative 
you know, we'll vote on Tuesday. So to that degree, you know, um, I'm supporting the system, uh, but I certainly don't want to empower our governor to outlaw abortion in the state by handing him a Republican legislature, you know. So, um, yeah. So am I, I'm, uh, I think there's so much wonderful about anarchist uh, thought, mutual aid and cooperation, um, I think should be the basis of society, civilization. Getting there, I don't know. <laughs> um, I've seen direct action work uh, in some specific instances, but I think, I don't know, it's a difficult um, stance to take. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a confused liberal. How's that? Yeah, that's <laughs> you know what I mean. That's that's relatable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean that that is the question, I don't want to right? Be is grand about my philosophy, but you know, um, I struggle with with um, the state, my relationship with it, and the whole democracy show. But well, you know. Yeah, I think that'll be relatable to a lot of folks listening um, who maybe are also voting when they otherwise wouldn't in recent years. Mm -hmm. um, definitely. May. And that, I mean, I was about to say that's sort of the, the whole question, right, is the how do we get there part mm -hmm. is difficult. Right. Um, all right. So with that sort of out there, uh what motivated me to invite you on the show was reading The Watch, which I will briefly, briefly summarize as Peter Kropotkin does a time travel. Um, and you can say more about it <laughs> once I finish asking this. I'll go ahead and read um, the... Your, your, so you specifically cast this as being the unauthorized se sequel or prequel prequel unauthorized prequel to Peter A. Kropotkin's memoirs of a revolutionist as imparted to Dennis Danvers by Anshi Mahur traveler from a distant future. And so I'm wondering where did you get the idea to write a story like this? It's like absolutely nothing else I've ever read. Um, and so, yeah, what, what was the motivation and what are sort of the implications of if Peter Kropotkin could time travel. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, uh, you know, kind of how the novel happened. <clears throat> that uh, An Chi, um, who came to me almost with the idea, but he's like a writer in the sense, uh, that, but he's trying out different timelines, different plot. Only he uses real people. So in a way, He's sort of me, you know. Um, he's playing God. I'm I'm creating the whole you know, the whole thing you're looking at. So, um, a, a trick I learned from Chaucer, you know, uh, that you it's not me telling the story; it's him. So I never set out, you know, I never set out to write a novel about anarchism, which goes back to your earlier. Um, you know, who I set out with a, a mission, so to speak. In fact, I knew very little about anarchism, you know, except in the most general sense. <clears throat> and so I wanted to write a space travel story, actually, and because I was always fond of those, and I thought, well, maybe I could do ones better than the ones that seem to annoy me now. But so I started reading a few famous ones, you know, Masters in the Field, and that brought me soon to Ursula Le Guin's The Dispossessed. If, if you're interested in anarchism at all, you like science fiction, uh, I highly recommend this novel. He depicts two societies and these two, two planets, uh, well, a planet and a moon of that planet. You know, the planet is sort of this neoliberal, prosperous place, you know, like 
like the best version of Earth, which, you know, with the, the same kind of baked in problems. Um, and the moon is occupied by a tensional society based on anarch anarchist principles. And there's an imagined uh, anarchist philosopher whose uh, ideas are based on Kropotkin. And um, so I read the novel and I was really taken. I mean, there's, as a fiction writer, I've got some critiques that the, I think the ending is way too slow. Slog through it, it does get better. But in, as a depiction of anarchist ideas in action, I thought it was really good. And it, and it was my introduction to a lot of those ideas. And so I wanted to know more. And in reading about the novel, I came across Kropotkin's name as the main underpinning of her book. So I went to the library and found Kropotkin's Memoirs of a Revolutionist, another book that I highly, it's a great book. It's a great memoir. The guy writes, he's through. So I, but I found it first in Russian and in English. I thought, well, this are both written by him. And I thought, well, somebody's left off the translator's name, nay, nay. He wrote both of them. Not only did he write English, he wrote gorgeous English. In fact, he, when he was living in England, he made his uh, living as a nature writer. Um, you know, modern, you know, popular science kind of stuff. Um, his voice is, you know, kind of reminiscent of Dickens, his work he adored. And I started, re you know, I read this thing, I thought, I had to write a novel in that voice, voicing those ideas. And uh, the character, I mean, uh, I, I was, you know, very fond of him, the person that came through in that memoir. And I found out there were many opportunities to read that voice. He wrote tons, um, and it's all free. The, um, there's the Anarchist Archives. I hope it's, I haven't checked on it lately. I'm assuming it's still up. Uh, yeah, it's still... every, everything he, and they you know it's got, they've got Emma Goldman, they've got, you know, they've got other, uh, you know, classic anarchist texts are all there to be read for free quite appropriately. And um, so I had this wonderful character. I had, I adored him and his ideas. We like to like in many ways. He liked animals. I liked animals. He likes kids and young people. I do too. But, you know, now at the same time, I had been playing with a time travel story in which someone from the past shows up in the present. And Peter volunteered. So I thought he might be my adopted hometown Richmond admired in the past and steeped in slavery. There's a tour of Monument Avenue, of course, I, and so recent events have been uh, very powerful for me personally. So I had Kropotkin, and now one of the things I did do deliberately, my job sort of been impersonating to write that novel. So I didn't want him to read ahead, so to speak. Um, he, he shows up in Richmond, um, contemporary time. I won't really, you know, there's a tell exactly what time he's supposed to be. And, but um, he he doesn't know his legacy or anything. He doesn't you know, have him run to the library and read some Chomsky or anything. And um, to, to be more, you know, appropriate to his character and the situation he finds himself, he's got to deal and um, which is just, you know, like believing the dead characters. That's often the way fiction works. You, you drop your characters into a mess and then you, the story evolves as they deal with it. And um, now all the incidents from his past that were used in the novel are, are true. Um, in his memoir, though, can be quite intimate, personal. And, and his, even his pamphlets which was spoken from the heart. So I had a lot to work with in terms of his personality and his values, of course. And um, so when he has to make, to be this character in the in Richmond, uh, basically as a homeless person, um, well, I had a lot to work with. And I had a city of Richmond. I moved here in 19... 87, 
I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of change, and uh, I know it very well, and I love it very much. And uh, now, when this novel came out, um, one of the reviewers in a, in a weekly newspaper said, "If you love Richmond, you will hate this novel." <laughs> so. The other extreme is um, there's a bookseller in town um, who, when out of towners come, they ask for, do you have any fiction set in Richmond that would give me a feel for it? You know, she re- recommends some Glasgow and stuff, but then also my book. <laughs> um, mm. So, because there's always been two sides to this place. It's only recently that the side I'm on has had any success. Yeah, and so for folks who don't know, Monument Row, that's all the Confederate statues, correct? Right, right. It was, okay, these, um, now I did, you know, I moved here in uh, 87, and I grew up in the segregated South. I remember, you know, colored only signs, all that crazy. And I was no stranger to this whole lost cause narrative, you know, but the, you know, but even in my Texas public university in the 60s, I had been di- disabused most of that nonsense, only to find it a matter of faith here among otherwise well educated people. My students, um, you know, university students, Mostly Virginia ed- educated at that time. I was teaching at Virginia Commonwealth. All told me that slavery had nothing to do with the Civil War. <laughs> and that, and some of them go, slavery wasn't as bad as they said. <laughs> you know, it was nuts. I'm sorry. And these monuments, um, the star of the show, and people may have seen that in the news, uh, in its graffiti glory. Um, that thing is just, it's Robert E. Lee. It's the biggest Godzilla. You know, it's there to send a message. And it was uh, all these, uh, and there's, you know, Jefferson Davis, he's a piece of work. And, you know, the, the whole crew was, you know, in, in, uh, on these honorific, uh, statues and, uh, constructed actually much after the war when, you know, white supremacy and that kind of, well, the kind of nonsense we have now that, you know, real Americans are white Americans was really in a, in a upset. And this was to send a message of where our values were as a city. And certainly the African American population knew what they stood for. I grew up in the segregated South. I knew what they stood for. And um, there were signs, you know, when anybody was, had threatened them, there were signs that would say, save our statue. And I, they just, you know, are. I know what they, the pronoun referred to, you know, white people. And uh, I want, you know, losers don't get to uh, <laughs> retell the story. Um, but that was mostly the, uh, yeah, I won't get into the whole politics of it, but the, they had a history of being controversial, but no one would make, they were never going anywhere. It was not a, it was not a battle worth fighting. It was not that everybody thought they were great. Nobody minded. Um, and then George Floyd had, and, uh, it changed many things, but it certainly changed my city. People took to the streets um, to demonstrate, and they transformed that fucking Lee statue into a powerful Black Lives Matter symbol in a people's park with monuments to the uh, victims of police brutality. It was beautiful. Um, and I saw, you know, good middle class white parents bringing their uh, little kids to see this. To learn. So uh, it's not as if, you know, it was really a black white thing, it was just this, you know, Confederate versus the 21st century thing. 
And when uh, Stonewall Jackson, a uh, thorough racist to the core, he was, he was the first statue to, to be yanked up by the city. Uh, Jeff Davis had recently been torn down. <laughs> he had a little help going. And the mayor declared those statues a public hazard and uh, or potential. So they're going to be removed. He moved very quickly on that. I, I don't always like the mayor, but this was a good decision. So when Stonewall was being yanked up, they'd given no advance notice expecting possible trouble. And so all the people that gathered around were local Richmond, huge crowd. Well, the, you know, they're trying to figure out how to get this thing out of there. And um, white, black, all sorts. There had been no advance warning. So it was just locals. Now, they they flooded in from the far counties. Who, it, you know, probably had you know, a lot more rebel flags and stuff. But when that thing finally got free and, you know, was pulled up, there was a huge shout. Approval. Uh, I was delighted. Um, whipped with joy to see those things go. And I witnessed nearly all of the, all of that room people. Uh, so I think it's, I don't know, reset the psychology of the city. And it's, it's a, you know, it's a young city, it's a vibrant city. Uh, it was just mired in this Confederate narrative. Wow, yeah, I mean, that's got to be amazing to see a city that you know so well make such a drastic change finally. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, so I, uh, and, and of course, it's been no annoying since, of course, we t speaking of retelling narrative, you know, the, the local police like to tell stories if that was, you know, I love to throw around the word riot. You know, and the closest thing there was a, a, to a riot near the uh, Robert E. Lee statue was when the uh, police came in, guns a blazing, shooting off uh, tear gas before the curfew that they joined. You know, so there were all these people there, and uh, who then were panic stricken, and you know, there were some injuries and stuff in that melee, but all inflicted by the police. And then, um, you know, you know, still to talk about riots. Um, there were lots of demonstrations that were peaceful. Monument Avenue is also a, a partly the statues were a real estate ploy. They, they made the avenue more attractive and they built these great mansions back in the day. And they're still there, the level. And not one of those things was damaged. You know, there was a cab and stuff like that spray painted on some on the roads and then some sidewalk, but not a single pane of glass. You know, if you want a riot, that was not a riot. Uh, now, you can see, uh, everybody should have a look at the, how, the transformation of that statue with um, graffiti. And then at one point, even someone had hooked up a projector so that the images of well, like George Floyd, for example, could be projected up on that uh, transformed fully magic. It was, it was great. Um, and like I said, the thing itself huge. You could have, you know, shown a IMAX movie on that or something. Mm. Yeah, I've been Im impressed by a lot of these uh, projections that folks have been doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, I'm living in Michigan now, but was in Philadelphia for the past several years and during the, um, uprisings after, uh, George Floyd's murder. And yeah, we, I mean, of course had the same thing of anything, <laughs> the most violent thing happening was the police. Yeah. And, yeah. um, and, uh, yeah, we're in, we're in Michigan. I was just in Michigan visiting a friend. Oh wow! So I'm I'm up north uh, near Alpena, if you know where that is. No, I was in Ypsil <laughs> I was in Ypsilanti. 
Okay. And uh, uh, my hosts, I think we're about to head up north to do some uh, vacationing type of thing. Um, yeah, it's it's mostly that we moved up here in part because of everything that happened in Philadelphia in the past few mm-hmm. years. Um, I don't want to talk too much about myself, right, right. Uh, but I will share one sort of funny thing uh, from the uprising in Philly, which was there's a Columbus statue in South Philadelphia. And for some reason, a lot of the, you know, white supremacists and other folks like that in the city thought that, of course, you know, all the anti-fascists are going to come take our Columbus statue. We We had no interest in it, care about it. It was not on the radar. Um, But they were down there, you know, sort of guarding it uh, with guns every day and waiting for us to come try and take it. And it just was, you know, was not a priority. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's funny. Richmond has a Columbus statue, had a Columbus statue too. And that was one of the first things to go. Now, it it wasn't entirely a surprise because people had um, uh, played graffiti, you know, put red paint on it and stuff in, in previous Columbus days. And um, so, <laughs> but the funny part was it did get, it did get pulled down. And it was by um, this lake, this little fat, you know, artificial lake and park. And, uh, for a brief for a brief time, if you Google the Columbus statue, it showed it in the lake. Somebody had tagged it, so that's where it would show up on Google. Maps. Um, so anyway, Columbus got a swim. <laughs> um, yeah, prop, props to whoever dropped that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> dropped that tag. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah, I, they quickly. Uh, he's, he's gone completely now. But yeah, nobody much asked. You know that he should come back either. So um, I think they finally got it. Um, yeah, he's not really a, somebody to celebrate over really if you dig down into the story, but um, there's so many. I mean, one of the things here in Virginia, of course, is Tom, St. Thomas Jefferson, who is, I mean, the whole country, of course, admires Jefferson at some level, but it's it's worshipful here. And the very notion that he could have had a relationship with Sally Hemings was just, you know, could be him, you know. And it's, even in the face of DNA evidence, it's been, you know, you know Monticello, his home, you know, there'd be tours, and of course he owned this incredible number of slaves um you know over the time keep the place going but they would call them in the two where they call them servants the term slave so that's changed now yeah that's the characterization of all the all the sort of founding fathers is interesting once you learn what what these men were actually like oh no um, so we've talked a little bit about cultural change, uh, in Richmond and other places, um, turning back to sci-fi as a genre, I'm wondering what do you think, so what do you think of the culture within sci-fi at the moment? Um, personally, I've been excited by folks being really keen to cover issues like environmental degradation defining what personhood means. Um, so I'm wondering, have you been, what do you think of the current sort of culture within sci-fi writing and what have you been excited to see or disappointed to see sort of in the genre? Mm-hmm. Well, I think in general, it's, it's, uh, it's, I think it's wonderful. Um, and I've seen publications, conventions, you know, all the, all the apparatus of the, the genre uh, reevaluate policies and um, subject matter and, and so on. Um, it's breathed life into it, actually. Um, because, you know, I mean, it is a genre that's been too white 
too male, too straight, too conservative, <laughs> too American, you know. And so it's become much more inclusive and expressive of a wider range of experiences. Uh, so I think it's all to the good. Um, disappointed, I don't know if it's, yeah. I th- I'm maybe just weary of um, post-apocalyptic stories. Uh, because they always seem to be um, like it might be kind of cool to fuck the planet, have it fall apart, and we'll get, you know, but we'll get by in some cool kind of post apocalyptic society with some kind of mongo jumbo and true grit, you know. And we're, we're at risk of bringing down the whole biosphere, so I don't think grit will help. I mean, we'll be grit, you know what I mean? So those story. I remember there used to be stories like that about um, don't worry about nuclear war. We'll you know we'll have plenty of gumption afterwards, and we'll have this kind of romantic uh, society that survives. But uh, I don't think those kind of stories do anybody any good. Um, the falling apart is what we need to maybe pay more attention to than whatever we can manage to cobble together. Yeah. I don't know if we need the warning. Um, so I have troubles with stories, though I do have tro- trouble with stories set in the future where climate change never seemed to have happened. There's some kind of minor footnote. So I'm a bit estranged from the business of usual science fiction days. Um, there's some stuff I've read called climate fiction, the too much of it, the story really isn't about climate. There is some kind of plot going on. But it's more like the set decoration acknowledges that the planet's falling apart in various ways. But, you know, it's like getting climate street cred or something. But I don't know what, if that's necessarily helping. But it's, you know, at the same time, I go, it's so damn hard to write about this stuff, uh, even though. If you're writing about the future, how do you ignore when, you know, the future is really falling apart for us? Now, um, on a more positive note about this genre, another thing that I think has been really exciting is how the short story has developed and evolved recently. Um, There's great writers like Jeffrey Ford and Kelly Link and uh, many others. Um, we've taken the science fiction and fantasy category and, and um, really opened it up and made it more interesting, at least to me. And um, there's a sense of play, you know, which you can't always say about the yeah, for, uh, so-called literary fiction. Um, so um, for potential writers, I think... Uh, it can be a, a, a more open genre. And uh, interestingly, too, <laughs> um, they pay. Um, a lot of science fiction magazines are, will pay for the stories they publish rather than just earning tenure with them, a literary magazine. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I think the, the state of the genre is it's good at the same time um, that I've been less interested in writing it lately. I do have another collection that someone is looking at of um, reimagined um, myths through a, a feminist lens. Um, but I haven't been writing much. I've been mostly writing music and songs. Um, I've got 11 books out there. Tell myself to play piano. I'm having fun. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's something I definitely noticed uh, in your work is the the sort of playfulness, um, which I really appreciated. I think, uh, like you were saying, the sort of post-apocalyptic story has been so oversaturated for a while 
uh, especially for folks, you know, my age, um, it almost feels like it was sort of a coping mechanism. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. And some of it was quite good. I mean, I thought, you know, and even, you know, like the wildly successful Hunger Games, I thought, well, what's the big deal? I read it. I thought, this is good. You know, you know that writer knew what she was doing. It's a good story. And, uh, you know, then, of course, get, get Jennifer Lawrence to play your character. It's not, not a bad thing to happen. So, um, you know, I, 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 it's not like I, I don't like this. I think it's, it's, it's something that has a, a limited, what do you use the term message, but, you know, what is, what is the point? That things are going to fall apart? We kind of already know that. And uh, so many of the stories, like I said, make it end up being like, oh, let, let's have the apocalypse so we can get on to this, you know, bows and arrows fun stuff. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, it's uh, something that, something that I've found everyone in sort of uh, radical anarchist activist circles realizes at some point is, you're still going to have to go to your day job during the revolution, you yeah. know? Oh, I know. It's, it's well, not... I mean, I think of Kropotkin, you know, he always, you know, you got to, he argued, you know, you got to function where you are. You can't refuse to work, for example, and, and live on the street and get anything going. And he, now he was able to work as a, as a journalist. basically. And, um, now of course he wrote tons for free, the pamphlets and books and all of that. But then he also wrote for uh, Nature magazine. And he was he was a scientist of uh, no small reputation uh, in his time. So, um, and, no, and interestingly, though, he did counsel direct action. He never did it himself. Protest demonstration. He spent a lot of time in jail for his ideas, um, but not for any actions that he did. So he was in his persona, his his personality was so such a gentle man. The 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 image of the anarchist is so, you know, violent bomb thrower and it just doesn't suit him at all. So he would have stood beside a bomb thrower and introduced and understood his his throwing that. I don't know, so he was get his contradictions like all of us. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's something a lot of our listeners will be familiar with is, you know, this, the struggle of not letting uh, extreme and intense ideas um, make you an extreme and intense mm-hmm. person. Right, right. All right. So getting down to sort of the last questions here, we have talked a lot already sort of just throughout about the thinkers and authors, some of couple of them who've been influential um, on your thinking and writing. But I'm wondering, is there, you know, any big thinkers or other authors in particular who have been a real big influence on your work? Well, you know, it's all sorts of things, of course. I've got, um, you know, a PhD in literature and in the play and fiction. And, you know, I've read lots and lots and lots and lots. And there's just so many things that have shaped me. So, but I do know that some things, I guess, have stuck more than others. Um, now, as far as a philosopher in terms of aesthetics and notions about it, uh, I guess Suzanne Langer uh, is very influential. And then as far as the craft of fiction, I already mentioned Henry James, but John Gardner. Um, I read the On Becoming a Novelist book at just the right time. <laughs> You know, stay with me. Uh, as far as writers, literature, I've, you know, I've read deeply and widely, but the Odyssey has been huge. And if if you're one of the many readers that thinks it's only about the Cyclops and Odysseus's little tall tales that he tells, <laughs> there's so much more to that. Almost anything you want to know about narrative is in there somewhere. And if it's not in there, it's in the Canterbury Tales. So um, I often advise, you want to be cutting edge, and you're a writer right now, 
read some old stuff, steal some of their tricks and use it now. Oh, wow, that's so cool. Now, um, I love Jane Austen and Dickens, um, both. Um, I reread all of Austen at the beginning of the pandemic. <laughs> it seemed like the, the perfect thing to, to have read her while we're isolated. Um, I like Raymond Chandler. Um, I told him, he taught me a lot about structure and point of view and voice and how to do a novel. Um, and then medieval romance. Um, it's very, a special kind of strangeness that I like. And, and I usually don't like sword and sorcery stuff, which I don't know, kind of plucks the worst out of the genre. But it's not a very violent genre, but most sword and sorcery, I mean, medieval romance is sort and sorcery amps all that up. And I, I, I loved old movies. I used to love old, you know, watch old movies on television as a kid, you know, back to the, thinking in terms of the, the wolf, Frankenstein meets the wolf, <laughs> for example, or uh, something like uh, Ginger Rogers, Fred Astaire, and those kinds of um, Right now, I listen to a lot of Taylor Swift. I think she's a great lyricist and, and usually talented, even though mega successful. So, um, yeah, I try to take in all sorts of stuff. And, um, you know, the Dao Te Ching, for example, was freaking. Wow, yeah, that, that is quite a range <laughs> well, <laughs> from the Canterbury Tales to Taylor bet. Swift. You, <laughs> you know, and uh, something that's incredible to me about Swift is that she's, I mean, she's been a big deal since she was 15 years old. And how someone sustains American fame at that, that level and not either, you know, kill yourself or become a total asshole. I don't, I don't know. I mean... Uh, what, what an intense uh, experience. But. Well, awesome. I normally end by asking for a book recommendation. I think we, we just got a couple. Um, if there's another, you know, book you'd like to recommend, I will recommend that listeners check out all of your work, um, especially The Watch and Leaving the Dead. Um but maybe since Taylor Swift is doing her her eras tour, what is your what is oh your my. favorite album? Well, I like the um, I, I especially like the two that she released during the uh, album names. I forget, but those uh, easy to find. Put them along the way. I mean, I remember hearing the first one. There was a clip uh, when NPR was doing their roundup of the things that they liked for the year and they played. Um, a cut and her first hit. I think it was You Belong to Me. And I thought, oh, that's great. Well, I like them. And then I listened to it. And I bought them all along the way. And I thought, I bought, one of the things I liked about her is that she's a ball. You know, she could she could still be doing country songs in the same old mold. Um, you know. So, but I do have to give you some offers. Uh, one in particular. One yes, in particular. Yes, please. Um, Richard Powers. Now, he gets recommended a lot for a novel called The Overstory. And it's, how to describe it, it's sort of um, the Moby Dick of trees. Um, he, you will learn more about trees than you ever thought you wanted to know. And it's very moving, it's very powerful. It certainly has a strongly anarchist theme undercutting the whole thing. Um, and you'll never quite look at a forest the same way again. It's full of wonderful characters, too. And um, a less sprawling book by him is called Bewilderment. And it's very much about uh, climate change as well. And if I can plug someone who's not such a big deal as Richard Powers, it would be Audrey Shulman. Theory of Bastards, uh, which is about bonobos, of all things, in the near future, um, just blew me away. And that's it's probably my most often recommended novel in the, you know, last 10 years.
years or so. Um, would be that. So there you have several. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Th both sound very interesting, especially Bonobos. Oh, no. That's, <laughs> oh, <it laughs> that's <is>. different. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because I'm very much interested in the animal human relationship and connection and, mm. and uh, well, and continuum of, I, I feel like one of our great failures, as smart as we are, is our estimation of other species. Um, that they're much more intelligent. And every whatever you know, than we are, then we we judge them. To be, I'm sorry, and in many cases, I, I think my dog is probably a better person than I. Am. <laughs> um, so, um, that theme is is nicely explored in in this novel, as well as a, a plausible kind of. Uh, you know, apocalyptic collapse. No zombies. Mm. No zombies. No zombies. I never understood right. why an apocalypse was all of a sudden going to come served up with zombies. You know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> isn't it bad enough that everything falls apart? Yeah. Right. <laughs> the, the the sprinkles right. of the modern apocalypse. Um. Well, wonderful. I think that that about does it. I really, really appreciate you sitting down with me today. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone listening. Please be sure to check out all of the books that we've discussed, um, as well as Mr. Danvers' other works. Uh, Dennis, do you have any last words for the listeners? Mm, no. Um, don't worry, be happy. Awesome. Okay, well, thanks again, and... Um, this this has been a really fascinating discussion. I got a whole list of books I now know, <laughs> need to go It'll read. Be a test too. I, I talked for over thirty years. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I will take notes. I will take notes. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Uh, in other news, look out, listeners, for Corey Massimino's interview with Jason Lee Bias soon. Yes, that is still coming. Uh, please do also let us know if there are guests you'd like to see us bring on in the future. You can support this show, Mutual Exchange Radio, as well as all of the Center for Stateless Society's projects, starting at just $5 a month on Patreon. You can find us on patreon.com slash c4ss.org. That's c4ssdotorg. And here is a big, big thanks to our producer-level patrons. Those folks are Martin Jacobson, David Colborn, ASDF, ASDF, Brady P, Jesse Posner, Casey Jamil, and Danny O'Brien. Thanks. Thanks.